On behalf of the Ruskin Art Club, I want to welcome everyone to another installment of the club's 2021 series of lectures and presentations. I'm Ted Bosley, director of the Gamble House in Pasadena and a member of the Ruskin Art Club. Uh, our topic tonight, architectural conservation, its uh, ethics and, is, and aesthetics, is deep and broad and close to my professional heart. And we have two of the best possible people to hear from tonight about it. David Spur, in his book, Architecture and Modern Literature, speaks of the, quote, aesthetics of architectural ruin and how it fetishizes the marks of time while restorations seek to erase them. Restoration, he defines, as the form of nostalgia that dreams of the timeless unity of the object with its ideal origins. The form of nostalgia that dreams if nostalgia can dream of the timeless unity of the object with its origins. In describing his Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, Bernard Maybeck said he intended to evoke a Roman ruin. He deliberately placed the allegorical figures of the peristyle with their backs to the viewer, high above the ground with bowed heads, as if in solemn sadness at some loss untold from the classical world. He placed the planters next to the bowed heads so that trailing vines could spring from the top of the structure, thus creating an instant impression of ruin. Ironic then that this instant ruin, having by the early 1960s become a dangerous one, was demolished and replaced by a stand-in. Maybeck himself was mercifully gone to higher realms by then. The new construction soon became its own beloved landmark, which many visitors believe is a restoration of the original. Can you hear Ruskin and Morris and Maybeck spinning in their graves? I can. The aesthetics of ruin were central to Ruskin's view of architecture. It could not be, if it could not be maintained properly, it should be allowed to die a dignified death by slow ruin. Quote, do not let us talk of restoration. The thing is a lie from beginning to end. Let no dishonoring and false substitute deprive it, that is a historic building, of the funeral offices of memory. This from the lamp of memory from the seven lamps of architecture. On the other end of the spectrum was Violet Le Duc, who restored Gothic cathedrals with great care, creativity, and channeling his, in his own scholarly way the many voices of the medieval past, each voice claiming a piece of the refreshed Notre Dame, Carcassonne, or Pierre Fond. Tonight we have the privilege of hearing from two distinguished experts about the world of architectural conservation as it is today. I believe they might illuminate a potential path through the landmine polarities of Ruskin and Violet Le Duc, one that allows us to imagine future generations <clears throat> enjoying the heritage of the built environment that we are fortunate to enjoy today. Because we have two leading cons conservation experts, we're prepared to go a little longer than usual uh, on our program tonight until 7 p.m. But we'll break for discussion at 6.30 latest. So um, that's a heads up for everybody, including the speakers. Our first speaker is Norman Weiss. Norman is a technical specialist in the, anal in the analysis and preservation of traditional building materials. He has taught at Columbia University since 1977 and is currently chair of the Preservation Technology and Training Board of the National Park Service. Trained as an analytical chemist, he is recognized for his more than five decades in the field of architectural cleaning and repair. He has worked on hundreds of buildings, principally in North America. Among his best known projects are the West Front of the US Capitol, made quite famous recently, the New York City, uh, the uh, Trinity Church in New York City, Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpieces, Falling Water, and the Guggenheim Museum. I should add that he was also a valued consultant on the conservation of the Gamble House <clears throat> back in the early 2000s. He is Director of Scientific Research of ICR, a New York City-based consulting firm, and Vice President of MCC Materials, where he has worked since 1995 to create innovative treatment-oriented materials for use by conservators of cultural heritage. 
His most current scientific research is on the consolidation of limestone and marble and the development of novel lime-based mortars, grouts, and paints. His presentation is titled Science, Architecture, and Ruskin's World. I'm going to introduce our second speaker now, and so you need to remember these, uh, these points. John Fiddler uh, is a British licensed architect with two additional degrees in building conservation. Until 2006, as conservation director of English Heritage in London, he was responsible for technical research, policy development, advisory services, publications, training, and outreach. Not much spare time there. In over 22 years with that organization, he cared for 420 historic properties, including, including ruined abbeys and castles, palaces and country houses, and the World Heritage Sites at Stonehenge and Hadrian's Wall. John was responsible for generating English Heritage, Heritage's conservation principles in 2008, a radical move away from Ruskin and his acolyte, William Morris. Now based in Los Angeles, Fiddler re runs a techni technical consultancy on historic preservation. He's completed repairs to a 1914 terracotta church in Long Beach. Uh, John's talk is entitled Shadows Cast Around the Lamp of Memory. Uh, before we get to our speakers, I'm gonna turn over the microphone now quickly to Stuart Denenberg, a Ruskin Art Club board member, distinguished board member, and Stuart's going to uh, say a few words uh, about another distinguished person in the history of architectural conservation. Stuart. Thank you. I hope I can be heard. Um, I was privileged to become a, a family friend of Ada Louise Huxtable, who pioneered architectural criticism in the New York Times and indeed won the Pulitzer Prize in 1970. Uh, she invented a, a new profession, says David Dunlap in the obituary of 2013. Uh, she, uh, as was, she was leaving the newspaper, she quite simply changed the way most of us see and think about man-made environments. At a time when architects were still enthralled to blank slate urban renewal, Ada Louise championed preservation, not because old buildings were quaint or even necessarily historical landmarks, but because they contributed vitally to the cityscape. I show you a photograph of Ada Louise, one of her many books, Architecture, Anyone? Cautionary Tales of the Building Art. And I give you, in honor of the centenary of her birth, March 14th, three days from now, uh, Professor Norman Rice. Thank you, Stuart. Um, let me first share my screen and then add one or two thoughts to what you've just said. Um, here we are, bear with me. And there we go. Um, thank you for saying that, Stuart. Um, I should tell the others that you introduced me to Ada Louise um, again many years ago, and it was a pleasure to know her and to do things with her here in New York City on this side of the country. And my interest in buildings, which is really much more on the construction side, the materials, the engineering, and so on. One would hardly imagine that a famous architecture critic would love it, but Ada Louise loved all of that. She was very interested in building technology. She would have been excited to be here with us tonight because I am gonna look at the science and technology and, and uh, really consider those issues. Um, I have lots of stories about her. I can't take the time to do it but one comes to mind immediately, which was on the day that the firm that I'm with was awarded the project to work on the Guggenheim Museum, one of the archivists said, well, we're releasing a lot of documents for, we, for you that we have in the archives. And uh, here's the review of opening day in 1959 at the Guggenheim Museum. And sure enough, it was Ada Louise's article. I got her on the phone right away and we had a laugh about it. And she acted to me as a kind of a secret mirror during that whole process and gave us an opportunity, the two of us to talk about other right buildings and other people that we knew in that whole circle. Well, I wanna get started with this right now so that we can stay on schedule. And I'm assuming everyone can see the screen properly and hopefully hear me as well. Uh, most of you know that Ruskin was born 
at the address of 54 Hunter Street in a place called Brunswick Square, not far from Russell Square. And perhaps he was the quintessential Victorian in that he was born in the same year as the Queen and he died almost precisely a year after she did. But from my perspective, and you're going to be hearing my perspective on Ruskin over and over again tonight, from my perspective, I think it's really interesting that his lifespan matches even more closely that of the sugar merchant, Henry Tate. Tate, who was the creator of the Tate Gallery on Millbank, which houses quite literally thousands of works by Turner. So there is this curious link in terms of the dates. And you will hear lots of dates and facts and figures. Hopefully, it will excite you. But I want to introduce at this point a word of caution so that no one says I wasn't warned. I will make no assumptions right now, but my thinking on Ruskin may simply not conform to yours. For example, the Brunswick Center, this building completed in 1972, is a building complex on the site of Ruskin's first childhood home. And it's a piece of London architecture that I like. Well, now that I've frightened some of you, maybe just a few, I, I must say that history is for me a very messy thing. It's most often impossible to decide when an idea or a design originates or even where. In these few minutes that I have, I wanna discuss some exciting changes in architecture in Ruskin's time and the technology that made that possible. To do that, I propose that you and I first go back to the origins of modern science in the Royal Society, loosely organized following a 1660 lecture by Christopher Wren, and then more firmly established with a Royal Charter in 1662. So we're gonna get a running start on Ruskin's era. Among the attendees at Wren's lecture were the Irish-born chemist, Robert Boyle, and the experimental physicist, Robert Hooke, seen here. Hooke's 1665 book, Micrographia, describing his work with the then quite new microscope is one of the greatest scientific publications of the 17th century. And I would add certainly the only one with a huge centerfold of a flea. It's a well-known publication. And as all of this science was brewing, London was struck by two disasters. First, there was a plague in 1665, and then the great fire of 1666, the latter destroying more than 13,000 structures. Along with Wren and others, the eccentric gentleman on the right submitted a plan for the rebuilding of the city. He's John Evelyn, elected to the society in 1663, and who, like Samuel Pepys, recorded the fire in his diaries, which are now in the British Library. I will certainly return to Evelyn later, near the end of the lecture. Wren, a professor of astronomy, and Hooke, a professor of geometry, became more directly involved in the reconstruction of London than most of the others. More importantly, chemists and botanists and physicists and horologists at that moment came together, all of them speaking the common language of science, which is mathematics. Some of them reinvented the look of English buildings, notably these two, and thus ultimately created the comfortable conservative London of Ruskin's youth. A few decades later, rather earlier, I should say, English science became practical technology. Um, I say, I'm saying earlier, meaning before Ruskin, after Hooke and Wren, when science became technology, the focus of this activity shifted northward from London to the industrial English Midlands. The painter Joseph Wright of Derby provides us with visual documentation of this fascination with science that was so powerful and so fashionable in the center of England. This is Wright's An Experiment on a Bird in the Air Pump, painted in 1768. The pioneering work in the development of these pumps, and you see one in the middle of this, was done a century earlier by Robert Hooke for Boyle's famous experiments on gases and the interrelationship of pressure and volume. I know I'm speaking high school chemistry. I'm hoping that you remember even a tiny amount of it. 
But it's no accident that Boyle's book called The Spring of the Air was made possible by this polymath for whom Hooke's law, a mathematically defining elastic behavior was named. And I'm calling Hooke a polymath as I see him as the greatest figure of that era in the late 17th century. But we're in the 18th now. Joseph Reif, the painter, often sketched at night and outdoors. And in the late 1770s, he is said to have become increasingly asthmatic. The physician who treated Wright's asthma was Erasmus Darwin. Born in 1731, Darwin was a founding member of the Lunar Society of Birmingham. Did any of you notice the full moon in the upper right hand corner of the Wright air pump painting? Perhaps not, now I've covered it up, but it was a subtle reference to that technology oriented society. The members included Joseph Priestley, Benjamin Franklin, James Watt, Matthew Bolton, and the truly remarkable Josiah Wedgwood. This is the Wedgwood family by the well-known animal painter George Stubbs, completed in 1780. Susanna Wedgwood, the oldest child is seen here on horseback, as are some of the others in the background. She married a son of her father's friend, Erasmus Darwin and was thus the mother of Charles Darwin. Josiah himself is seated unhappily at the far right because he's about to have his right leg amputated. It was damaged by smallpox when he was 12, ultimately preventing him from using the potter's kick wheel and propelling him into an extraordinary career as a ceramic designer, a businessman, and a technological innovator. I know you're tired, but we're getting there because now I'm gonna to come to a big picture issue, which is incredibly relevant to so much of Ruskin's writing. My question is this, does industrial production necessarily have an adverse effect on aesthetics? So perhaps Wedgwood can answer that question. This urn is from the Wedgwood and Bentley period, 1769 to 1780. And for me to be absolutely clear, this urn is an industrial product marketed often in showrooms to England's growing middle class. A similar answer to my Ruskinian question is to be found in the work of, work of Matthew Bolton. Bolton was the partner of James Watt in the production of the steam engines that powered so many of England's factories. So clearly an industrial. Bolton developed, however, a layered material called Sheffield plate as a less expensive alternative to solid silver. These urns were made in about 1815, in other words, just before Ruskin's birth. There are other examples too that address my question of industrialization and aesthetics, or alternatively, industrialization versus aesthetics. But I think, for example, I have a particular twist on this. That's the production of artist paints as another great example, started in the 1840s based on improvements, believe it or not, in the airtight packaging of food. This made possible plein air painting in color rich oils rather than just in low chroma watercolors. Is the painting of nature outdoors a bad thing? I certainly don't think so. So forgive me now if I digress a little bit further in the name of context to comment on the essential elements of industrialization whether it is as we know it today or as Ruskin knew it then. Two of these are mechanization and division of labor. The latter particularly believed by Ruskin to be a, a 19th century evil. Now, before I go deeper there, I just wanna to comment to you, obviously you recognize Chaplin in modern times. The picture on the right dates around 1928 when this building was open. This is Henry Ford's River Rouge plant. At, at that time, the largest industrial factory in the world, and a great example of how division of work, labor works to produce some complicated things. <clears throat> now, Ruskin, let's come back to him, famously wrote in volume two of the Stones of Venice, we have much studied and much perfected of late, the great civilized invention of the division of labor, divided into mere segments of men, broken into small fragments and crumbs of life, so that all the little piece of intelligence that is left in a man is not enough to make a pin or a nail. 
Now, I suppose that these seemed to him to be connected very much to his own time. But they were, of course, machines in the ancient world and in the medieval era of cathedral building and in the age of Leonardo da Vinci, certainly. And the assembly line based on division of labor seems to be a Chinese invention for the production of porcelain as early as the reign of the Kangxi emperor and probably much, much earlier. So I'm asking you to consider Ruskin's recommendation that a single craftsman should be able to design and happily build beautiful and useful things from start to finish. Now also consider England's obsession with, for example, the long case clock in the 18th century, made possible by the way, by Robert Hooke's invention of the anchor escapement in about 1658. If I seem obsessed with Robert Hooke, I will admit I am. But back to the clocks, did one person in the 18th century, any one person typically construct the mechanism of such a clock, cast the weights, make the bells, the pendulum, paint or engrave the dial, fabricate the hands, and do all the fancy woodwork of the case? No, no, of course not. The third essential component of industrialization is interchangeability of parts. And it was used to produce guns like this Colt Patterson revolver of 1836. Half a century earlier, as the story goes, a pair of French muskets that could be disassembled and randomly assembled again was owned by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson gifted them to the inventor Eli Whitney, although the most important character in this piece of industrial history is, I believe, the relatively unknown Thomas Blanchard who worked at the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. And so in the mid 19th century, European visitors came to New England to admire what was then called the American system of manufacture. So we have the three components, mechanization, division of labor, and ability of parts. That's the industrial world. Now, like so many of his time, Ruskin's scientific interests were numerous from childhood onward. I admit that, but I wanna focus for the first few minutes on geology. I wanna emphasize that by the time that Ruskin started at Oxford, a scientific discipline of geology was really well underway. This remarkable section from the mountains of Northwestern Wales at the far left to London at the right was published in 1815. It accompanied William Smith's A Geological Map of England and Wales and Part of Scotland, a map that was six feet across and eight and a half feet high. The map represented about 15 years of work by Smith who was a surveyor, a fossil collector, and a canal engineer. In the late 18th century, as Smith began his map, those who studied the earth had become divided into two camps. One of those was centered on the teachings of Abraham Gottlob Werner in the Mining Academy in Freiburg in Saxony. Werner assembled an enormous study collection of rocks and minerals and published a descriptive textbook with classifications based on simple observation, observable characteristics, I should say. A translation into English of his writing on color was published in 1814 as in English, Werner's Nomenclature of Colors, and then improved considerably in 1821 by the Scottish botanical painter, Patrick Syme. Werner saw most of the earth as a sequence of horizontal layers laid down by the action of water. And so his followers were often referred to as the Neptunists. In fact, he felt that the earth had changed relatively little since the recession of the waters of Noah's flood, to him a singular and global catastrophic event. In Scotland, another way of thinking was that of James Hutton, who along with John Playfair and James Hall described the earth as a much more dynamic and more ancient place. Hutton's followers, sometimes called the Plutonists, believed that phenomena seen today, including rock weathering, were critical to an understanding of the earth's history. And they sought to explain the anomalous position of some unusual sediments, especially those of the, what's called here, the great unconformity at a place called Sicker Point, east of Edinburgh. These Plutonists ultimately won the war and their thinking was the basis of the first real earth science textbook, Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology 
the first volume of which was published in 1830. Lyell is seen here in the mid 1840s in a remarkable photograph by David Octavius Hill. His book was an expansion of the ideas of Hutton and Playfair, and it codified a concept called, and it's quite a mouthful, uniformitarianism. The idea that relatively minor geological events taking place now can inform us about the very distant past. That certainly made sense in the British Isles where violent earthquakes and volcanic eruptions were incredibly rare. For that reason, British and most other European geologists made the pilgrimage to Pompeii and the Bay of Naples in this period. With a focus on Mount Vesuvius and Pozzuoli, it was the scientist's version of the Grand Tour. This is an 1858 letter from Lyell, written in a hotel in Naples, to the author of a book called Hints on Public Architect, Robert Dale Owen. Owen was the Scottish-born social reformer and architectural writer perhaps then the American Ruskin. Lyell writes in a very matter of fact way as scientists often do, and he's in the midst of the political and military chaos of the Risorgimento. He writes, I came home from Vesuvius and yesterday found myself imprisoned here for more than six hours. Be so good as to remember me particularly to your brother. That brother was the geologist David Dale Owen who prepared for the 1849 book a detailed appendix on the testing and selection of building stones for the Smithsonian Institution, funded by the English chemist and mineralogist, James Smithson. The appendix incorporates tech data supplied by Charles Page of the US Patent Office. And so even here in North America, geology as a science-based discipline, well beyond the simple admiration of interesting rocks was emerging at mid-century. And I hope you've noticed, or at least recognized, at the lower right, an illustration from the book, which is Renwick's design for the Smithsonian's castle on the National Mall. 1831, Darwin took a copy of the first volume of Lyell's Principles on HMS Beagle, seen on the right, along with Werner's book on systematic description by color. So by the time he got to the Galapagos Islands, he had the intellectual tools necessary to begin his study of the animal kingdom in that remote, remote place. Like Ruskin, Lyell attended the geology lectures of William Buckland, although he did so 20 years earlier. I hope you'll enjoy this uh, silhouette. Silhouette's incredibly popular, particularly in the first half of the 19th century, but I've never seen as fascinating a silhouette as Buckland, his wife and young son cavorting with their collection of fossils at home. Um, Buckland, was also the Dean of Westminster. So he represented, I believe, in a personal way, the conflict between science based on the gathering of observations and religion based in, essentially on faith. Even after the publication of Lyell's Principles, Buckland, the teacher of first Lyell and then Ruskin, continued to struggle to resolve Wernerite and Huttonite ideas about the earth and still, in the intellectual ether throughout this period, amazingly enough, was the obsessive work of Archbishop Usher, who in 1650 concluded quite specifically that the earth was created in 4004 BC. On the 22nd of October, oh, and at about 6 p.m. Now Ruskin's 1858 lecture on iron in Tunbridge Wells, not well studied, but it suggests to me that his understanding of mineralogy and geochemistry was in fact, not terribly good. He tells his audience that iron is the source of all color in nature. He states emphatically, and I quote, white is what the color of the earth would be without its iron. That would be its color, not here or there only, but in all places and at all times. His remarks suggest to me that he's perhaps forgotten about the role of calcium and magnesium and manganese and copper and a few other things. Or perhaps that Buckland's lectures emphasized paleontology, a really new science, at the expense of other more fundamental aspects of the geological sciences in general. Ruskin returns to geology a few years later and specifically the subject of mineral formation by crystallization in the ethics of the dust. Some of this is interesting, 
Some is entertaining, although not much scientific information is actually conveyed to the young students, his, and he calls them, little housewives. At nearly the end of chapter two, for example, called The Pyramid Builders, which goes on and on at great length about Egypt, he finally shows them a crystal of fluor. This is the mineral fluorite found in Derbyshire, where it's called Blue John, as in these urns on the left, and found in Cumbria, the region in which Ruskin's Brentwood is located. Now, it obviously helps if the reader, that is you or me, today, already knows some mineralogy. And that makes me ask, who was the audience originally for? What was this book's purpose? And that is still a little bit unclear to me. Now it's time for another one of those big questions. When does the idea of modern architecture appear? And I don't mean just in Ruskin's writings. To put it a little differently, when does the 20th century really start? I believe that it starts in the 1840s with innovations in the use of iron and glass and of artificial stone. London's Crystal Palace, just a few years later, was famously derided by Ruskin in the Stones of Venice at the very beginning when he calls it some very ordinary algebra. Three years later, he unkindly described it as having been built, quote, in order to exhibit the petty arts of our fashionable luxury, the carved bedsteads of Vienna, the glued toys of Switzerland, the gay jewelry of France. Well, perhaps decorative things becoming available now to many were simply not of interest to him. But presumably they were to Prince Albert, whose exhibition in 1851 was actually called the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations. Among the American exhibitors, and there were many, was Samuel Colt, now with his 1851 Navy revolver, and the photographer Matthew Brady. Of the many UK participants, and that meant perhaps half of the total of 15,000 exhibitors, my personal favorite is a man named Frederick Ransom. He was an innovator in the production of sodium silicate, better known as water glass, described in the Scientific American magazine just a few years later as an agent in the manufacture of artificial stone and attracting considerable in attention at present. At the Crystal Palace, Ransom won a medal for his artificial stone, including this urn that he exhibited, seen on the right, and the columns in that staircase at the University of Wales in Aberystwyth. In the following year, he started something called the Patent Cilicia Stone Company with a group of financial backers that included Charles Darwin. And that medal that he was awarded by the committee, or perhaps even by Prince Albert himself, well, here it is. In 1865, Ransom switched to Portland cement, recognizing it to be the material of the future. And he established then the patent concrete stone company. Of course, Ruskin, in chapter two of the seven lamps, the lamp of truth, identified, I'm quoting, the use of cast or machine made ornaments of any kind as architectural deceits. He went on to say quite harshly that we must not use any artificial stone cast into shape, nor any stucco ornaments of the color of stone or which might in any way wise be mistaken for it as the stucco moldings in the cortile of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, which cast a shame and suspicion over every part of that building. Indeed, quite harsh. But my problem with this remark is mostly that there's a rich tradition of casting in the arts that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. This Shang Dynasty ritual vessel, for example, dates from the middle of the second millennium BC. Incidentally, it sold about four years ago for $27 million. And molded architectural elements were used throughout the Greco-Roman world. So as I said at the outset, history is a messy thing. The 1836 Conservatory of Paxton, the head gardener at Chatsworth, is often cited as the basis of the London Crystal Palace. But the idea that Paxton was the developer of this type of construction, I believe that's largely because it was his design that was selected, nothing more. In fact, the curved ribs of Paxton's earlier conservatory were made out of wood. So in my mind, the pioneer was actually the Irish iron worker, Richard Turner, whose palm house at Kew was completed in 1848. The rarity of the plant collections there 
was so great at the Royal Botanic Gardens that a police force called the Q Constabulary was created in 1847. This massive set of keys probably dates to that time. And the technology for the Palm House, well, it came from the development of railroads two decades earlier. The rolling of iron rails was first done in 1820 at the Bedlington Foundry for the Stockton and Darlington Railway, built to transport coal to the Northeast Coast. And before you ask, yes, Bedlington, the town famous for those interesting looking terriers. The first steam locomotive for that line called Locomotion Number no. One was designed by a man named George Stevenson. There was also an experimental passenger coach called Experiment. So Stevenson was apparently not terribly creative when it came to names. Robert Stevenson created another engine called the Rocket, which is seen here, which was built in Newcastle in 1829 for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, which opened with passenger service in the following year. By then, Robert's father, George, was living in Liverpool. He moved in 1832 to Chesterfield, only nine miles from Chatsworth, where his very serious interest in gardening made him a rival of, of course, Joseph Paxton. The careers of these people are interconnected so amazingly in this whole period from the 1820s on through the 1850s and 60s, it's quite remarkable. Now, once again, let's return to Ruskin and the Crystal Palace. At the end of the exhibition, it was amazingly enough dismantled and rebuilt in Sydenham, south of London. That second version is seen here in a stereoscopic card. These things were just coming into favor at that point, having been shown to and very much admired by Queen Victoria at the Great Exhibition. Now, if you look carefully in this 1854 print, you'll see it in the distance, past those dinosaurs. But wait a second, dinosaurs in England, you say? Yes, made of artificial stone. In Ruskin's time in Oxford with Buckland, he must have heard a great deal about dinosaurs. Buckland, who wrote one of the Bridgewater treatises attempting to resolve geology with theology, also wrote the first full account of a fossil dinosaur that he named Megalosaurus, meaning giant lizard. Imagine then how distressed Ruskin must have been by the juxtaposition of these concrete beasts with the now resurrected Crystal Palace. In an 1854 pamphlet, on the reopening, Ruskin asked if the conclusion is that in the center of the 19th century, we suppose ourselves to have invented a new style of architecture when we've simply magnified it a conservatory. Mechanical ingenuity is not the essence either of painting or architecture. His opinions apparently hadn't changed since the Seven Lamps in which he called the use of iron a corruption and stated, and I quote, true architecture does not admit iron as a constructive material. Such works as the cast iron central spire of Rouen Cathedral or the iron roofs and pillars of our railway stations or some of our churches are not architecture at all. But he was forced to make some exceptions, remarking, I don't see how we can help allowing Brunelleschi his iron chain around the Dome of Florence or the builders of Salisbury Cathedral, their elaborate iron binding of the central tower. As an established art critic, Poor Ruskin had to go to Manchester in 1857, along with about 1.3 million other visitors, including the American astronomer, Mariah Mitchell. There, yet another huge iron and glass structure housed over 16,000 works of art in an exhibition called The Art Treasures of Great Britain. Did Ruskin hate that building too? Well, yes, of course he did. In the later years of his life, Ruskin would surely have been aware of another tsunami of technological change. In May of 1883, the East River Bridge was completed, linking the cities of New York and Brooklyn. 272 feet, its massive masonry towers were the second tallest structures in all of New York at the time. The Washington Monument was completed in the following year with the ceremonial installation of a small pyramidal cap at the very top made of a then precious metal, aluminum. Like the towers and anchorages of the bridge, it was a load-bearing stone structure and remains the very tallest of that type today. But both were essentially dinosaurs, representing the end of an era of piling rocks onto each other that had lasted for thousands of years. At the turn of the century, as the craze for taller and taller structures heated up, 
fantasy illustrations like this one became quite popular. This moment represented not just the development of the first skyscrapers, but also the completion of many of Europe's great Gothic cathedrals with slender spires and towers. And here you can see the Washington Monument peeking out from behind the Great Pyramid at Giza and nearby one of the 19th century twin towers of Cologne Cathedral. I love these things. Now, more recently, my engineering colleagues have applied the term slenderness ratio to the proportions that sometimes do not allow skinny buildings or skinny columns to remain standing. As a non-engineer, my own definition of this design parameter is, with apologies to Herbert Spencer and his 1864 Principles of Biology, survival of the fattest. Bartholdi's Liberty Enlightening the World was dedicated in October of 1886. The world is moving quickly now. We've gone only from 1883 86. The first speaker at that New York City event was Ferdinand de Lesseps, the developer of the Suez Canal. What sense does that make in New York City? Well, in the 1860s, Bartholdi had designed a colossal statue of an Egyptian woman, fully draped and holding a lamp for sight at the northern entrance of the canal. Here we're seeing the torch that was prepared for New York, presented as a preview to the American public in Philadelphia in 1876. The Franco-Egyptian project was ultimately not pursued, making the site in Port Said in Egypt available for a tall lighthouse built in 1869 of concrete. The world was indeed changing. Bartholdi's basic design of the Egyptian woman, heavily draped, was then recycled into the sculpture that we know as the Statue of Liberty. But the statue itself doesn't actually interest me all that much. In 1869, when the lighthouse in Egypt was built, the engineer who had worked with Bartholdi on the internal structure for his monumental project died. And that was Eugène ville le duc the anti-Ruskin. So Gustave Eiffel became the second designer of the internal support seen here in a preliminary assembly that was done in Paris. Now, some of ville le ducs ideas were indeed retained, including creating the statue in hammered copper sheets and devising how to attach them to each other and to a support. But the shift to Eiffel's rather elegant structural design of an open frame is certainly, if I can use the 1954 lyrics of Steve Allen, certainly the start of something big. Now, Eiffel's Tower of 300 meters, completed in 1889, was bitterly opposed, as some of you know, by dozens of French authors, artists, and musicians, among them Guy de Maupassant. They all signed a great petition against it. A reporter was thus surprised to discover that every day the short story writer took his lunch in a restaurant at the Tower. De Maupassant explained that it was the only place in Paris where he could dine without having to look at Eiffel's useless and monstrous structure. And those were the terms of the petition, useless and monstrous, presumably because here for almost the very first time, People are seeing engineering raw, engineering exposed, not covered up. Now, to summarize where we've come to in the last minutes, if that's even possible, we all need to look at so many events and so many people who influenced the creation of the technology of the modern world. I've certainly left out much more than I've included this evening. Understanding it is admittedly difficult, even for specialists in architecture and engineering. And the historical overlay of controversial, and biased criticism makes that even more difficult. Some think of Ruskin as talking to his audiences about new subjects like air pollution and decent housing for the working class, but he certainly wasn't alone and most often was not the first. Consider Prince Albert's model cottages and the improved larger scale housing associated with the American born banker and philanthropist, George Peabody. With respect to pollution, the truly significant studies are those of the Manchester based chemist Angus Smith, his 1859 article on the air of towns and a massive, massive 1872 opus called Air and Rain. Angus Smith was the father of acid rain studies. Now I, of course, like to look backwards as well at our friend John Evelyn, whom I mentioned earlier. And here he's seen in a 1650 engraving by the French artist Robert Nanteuil. In 1661, Evelyn wrote an amazing pamphlet that you see here on the left 
called fumifugium, or the inconvenience of the air and smoke of London. The Latin quote on the title page, smaller print, sorry, is from Lucretius de Rerum Natura and can be roughly translated as heavy fumes of charcoal creep into the brain. Evelyn described the ailments, identified the problem as the burning of coal, and proposed solutions, including moving some industries, brewing, dyeing, soap making, lime burning, outside of London. Two years later, that pamphlet was mentioned specifically in something called The Ballad of Gresham College, a song written about the startup of the Royal Society. And if you'll bear with me, I will quote stanza 23. Tis the sea coal smoke that always London does environ, which does our lungs and spirits choke, our hanging spoil and rust our iron. Let none at fumifuge be scoffing who heard at church our Sunday's coughing. Finally, let me comment once more on 19th century innovation. The amateur designer of this piece of furniture in the early 1840s had a substantial study collection in his home. To be able to go from cabinet to cabinet and wanting to stay seated for efficiency, he added small casters to his favorite armchair. But he soon discovered that the legs were simply too weak. So he substituted iron legs from a hospital bed then attached larger wheels, and the whole thing worked. Thus, the rolling office chair was created with a series of small incremental improvements. Thank you for being so patient. Someone needs to come back on now. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you, Norman. It's Thank over you. to you now, John. And uh, then we'll hold uh, for questions until uh, around 6.30. Great. <clears throat> um, I'm just checking that you can see the full screen. Is that we're correct? Seeing, we're seeing presenter view. Okay, just hold on. <clears throat> How's that? Uh, not yet. Still presenter view. Is that not working? Hmm. Not yet. There we go. <clears throat> Is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Very good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, spectacular presentation by Norman. I've made copious notes. <clears throat> um, Ted has um, prefaced some of what I'm going to talk about, but uh, hopefully not in too much detail. So uh, let's get on with my presentation, uh, the shadows cast around the lamp of memory. And like Norman, I'm taking a rather sanguine view of uh, some of Ruskin's um, pronouncements in, in the field of preservation. However, there's no doubt at all that Ruskin's legacy is enormous. Uh, I've just listed some of the things that uh, he achieved here, but for my purposes, I'm going to talk principally about the inspiration gained from the seven lamps of architecture for the creation of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings and ultimately for the sparks that founded the uh, National Trust in England and Wales. Uh, many of you will know too that uh, Ruskin's visits to Italy on his version of the Grand Tour uh, inspired him to write obviously the um, Stones of Venice but um, his visit to Pisa in the 1840s, and particularly his visit to what was then a terribly declining and decrepit Santa Maria della Spina on the banks of the Arno River, uh, really did inspire him uh, dramatically. He made several uh, wonderful uh, renderings 
of that building in its uh, time. But when he revisited in the 1870s, he was outraged to find that the building had been completely dismantled and rebuilt three foot higher on a new embankment. Uh, the original damage having been caused by river floods. And of course, in the moving and the reconstruction, original materials had been lost and he was very outraged by all of that. And so in his lamp of uh, seven lamps of architecture and particularly of truth and memory, uh, we get the um, delivery of a polemic which lasted through, throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. But like Norman, I want to move backwards in time to the 18th and even to the 17th century to explain that whilst uh, Ruskin was working up ahead of steam in the 18th 40s, people had been quietly getting on with repairing historic buildings in a rather sensitive fashion for a very long time. Uh, in the Middle Ages, of course, my predecessors uh, in the um, uh, surveyors of the king's works, the master masons of the kings and queens, had been repairing uh, castles, in particular fortifications and palaces, uh, since the 13th century. Uh, by the uh, 18th century, uh, some very grand names uh, were in fact carrying out repairs, quite modest repairs and quite sensitively uh, modest interventions to historic buildings that may be surprising. For example, um, Nicholas Hawksmoor, uh, known as the Richard Rogers of his day for his Baroque extravaganzas in central London, was quietly getting on with a local engineer in straightening the overleaning transept here, the north transept of Beverly Minster. <clears throat> Beverly Minster uh, delighted him so much he later copied its towers for the front of Westminster Abbey. And down the road in the Midlands, uh, Anthony Salvin, uh, was, uh, he was uh, working for the uh, Ministry of Woods and Forests and they were responsible for lots of the ruined castles belonging to the crown. And he was quietly getting on, carrying out relatively sensitive repairs, uh, a stitch in time kind of work. And you see here in this diagram, in this uh, picture, uh, a photograph, an aerial photograph of Newark, uh, the remnants of, of Newark Castle. Uh, he carried out thousands of these over the years, uh, these uh, repairs, including works to Westminster Hall, uh, the Palace of West Westminster, without which we wouldn't have the great Houses of Parliament uh, today, the remnants of the medieval period. Uh, Norman and I, and I'm sure others in the audience here, belong to the Society of Antiquaries of London, and it has an august and rather eccentric reputation in history, uh, dating from the 1850s with a royal charter. Um, it uh, had, right from the start, serious interests in uh, the antique, the aged, and in particular uh, works of monuments lying in fields uh, around uh, the country. <clears throat> William Stukeley, of course, who uh, was sponsored at various times by royalty, carried out surveys in the 1720s of Stonehenge and other ancient sites and drew quite particular sketch designs of those fascinating monuments of his period as curiosities, I have to say, but nevertheless, uh, those drawings and survey notes come down through history and have been of great use to subsequent curators. <clears throat> John Carter, John Britton and Robert Willis, all of these uh, commissioned or undertook to produce fantastic sets of measured drawings of great monuments, cathedrals, and those were a great boon in the late 18th century when serious neglect and decay was affecting these buildings and uh, rather ignorant uh, architects and their patrons were looking to make changes to them. <clears throat> John Carter in particular, uh, you see one of his drawings here on the left, was instrumental in not only um, uh, recording monuments in case of damage, but also of publishing and campaigning to stop destruction which is what he achieved with the help of the society at Durham Cathedral, where uh, uh, James Wyatt, the architect, uh, 
<clears throat> had a plan to demolish the great Galilee Chapel and also to really scrape back the elevations by up to uh, two inches on every plane in order to do away with some crumbling masonry. That was uh, stopped after the east front of the building had been drastically changed. So by the time of Ruskin, uh, others had been doing this kind of the same kind of work, uh, issuing polemics and notices, complaining about destruction for a good while. And many decent good architects and surveyors had been repairing cathedrals and monuments all the while. Uh, Ruskin gets all the fame and publicity over time, but as Sir Kenneth Clark and Nicholas Pevsner both said, he wouldn't be noticed even today had not uh, Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin died in 1852, because many of Ruskin's ideas in this area, particularly those in the lamp of truth and the lamp of memory, emanate from Pugin. Uh, they didn't get on. Uh, Ruskin hated the fact that uh, in midlife, Pugin had converted to Roman Catholicism and became a great polemicist for the cause of that faith through architecture, which was abhorrent to, to Ruskin. Um, in uh, later life, uh, some of Pugin's biographers uh, dug out materials to prove that in fact, Ruskin protested too much about not having conceived of anything from the basis of the writings of Pugin. And you see a few of them here on the screen that I've, I've dealt with. Essentially, both true principles and the lamp of truth talk about functionality, honesty in design and materials, the opposition to foam materials as uh, they saw it in um, stucco, scagliola, applied finishes, casts of various kinds. They saw honesty in the value of handcraft, something that even uh, Lenin in his 13th instruction to the masses during the revolution in Russia uh, uh, issued edicts on and preserved many of the great palaces outside uh, uh, St. Petersburg on the basis of the sweat and labor of the craftsmen. True Principles, The Lamp of Truth, uh, dealt with morality in architecture, the link between architectural style and societal attitudes, and how one could influence the other for good or ill. Uh, Pugin, in his contrasts with satirical drawing showing um, sordid, um, cheap, classical detailing versus holier-than-thou Gothic architecture, uh, put that case over very forcefully. And both of these gentlemen uh, eschewed about memory that buildings should respect and honor the culture from which they, they, they developed. Pugin has always fascinated me. Um, he never responded to any of the attacks, quite vicious attacks that Ruskin made upon him, uh, but sought in said uh, through deeds, uh, through the sponsorship of um, the Emancipation of Catholics Act uh, at the beginning of the 19th century and through the, the development and wealth then emanating from the Catholic lordships to, uh, by example, show how different he, he could be. But he did spend time uh, complaining about the destruction of the great ancient cathedrals of England. At Lincoln, at Litchfield Cathedral, for example, he complained that the famous James Wyatt again was at it. He removed all the medieval sculptures and then pasted Roman cement all over the west facade, causing great damage. While at Malvern Abbey, uh, Pugin uh, pilloried the local architects and the local gentry who were paying for works there, claiming that a couple of hods of mortar had been spent on the building but the lordships had then dedicated a, a brand new rose window to themselves for all their efforts. The lamp of memory is at the heart of a great deal of British conservation theory uh, and ethical considerations of the 19th and 20th centuries. And I cite here 
some of the key phrases in it, but I show you just for a change and moving out of Ruskin's sphere altogether, a couple of pictures from Palmyra, uh, the World Heritage Site, third century classical remains in Syria. Uh, just to illustrate a couple of the points here. Uh, the top photograph shows uh, actually an Arab uh, strengthening of a third century classical Roman bastion. Uh, what you see there, those round drums in the, in the walls are in fact columns, Roman columns from one of their temples. Uh, this was to reinforce the walls in the 12th century against crusader roads, uh, inroads into this part of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of Syria at the time. Uh, Ruskin would have said, well, that's how it comes down to us from the past. That's how we should keep it. Uh, the French, however, by the 1920s, when they were uh, responsible for this part of the Levant, uh, had other ideas and reverted to uh, the thoughts of Villa le Duc. And in the bottom photograph, I show an example here, the, the, these photographs pre-ISIS explosions in recent history. Uh, the uh, amphitheater there with its proscenium uh, uh, up to about the heads of the doors is only the original classical detailing and everything above that was reconstructed by the French in, in uh, uh, 1926. Now, of course, it's destroyed again by uh, the unfortunate intervention of ISIS. Uh, it really wasn't until Ruskin's acolytes, William Morris and the architect Philip Webb got to grips in the 1870s that Ruskin's words were broadcast uh, on a grand scale. These two uh, delivering through letters to the Athenaeum and in various uh, pieces of literature, the founding of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings and its manifesto. And they wrote to Ruskin to seek his permission to use some of his clauses from the Lamp of Memory in their document. I don't expect you to read this, but essentially the same kind of meanings are coming through from Ruskin in 1849 and, and them in 1877. Uh, Morris, like Ruskin, uh, had uh, an empathy with the craftsperson, and obviously a lot of his career was spent in emulating and re restoring, reviving in many ways, uh, medieval craft traditions in uh, furniture, uh, uh, wallpapers, uh, tapestries, textiles, and, and so on. Interestingly, some of their theories um, moved into the political arena, and I'm told that Morris did never met Karl Marx, but they had an in interconnection through Engels, uh, and it's quite interesting to suppose how those connections might have might have developed. SPAB um, had a, a very good case on its hands. It saw throughout England in the 19th century as the Industrial Revolution took hold, wealth increased, patrons with money to spare lavished it on these neglected uh, medieval cathedrals, uh, sorely neglected in the 18th century, uh, some of them barely able to stand. And this lavishing of money on these buildings could cause a great deal of damage. And I, I cite the example of St. Albans uh, Abbey, you can see in the two pictures on the left-hand side of the screen, some actually quite careful and archeologically accurate repairs by George Gilbert Scott in the 1860s were uh, replaced after he died by Edmund Beckett, uh, Lord Grimethorpe, who uh, mostly at his own expense uh, carried out this drastic alteration to the building you see, you see here today. Uh, Morris and Webb and their cohorts really fought a, a long, hard battle with Scott over Tewksbury Abbey. And I show you this picture here so that you can see in the tower, uh, particularly, scars of other roof lines from the medieval past which have come down through the ages uh, as changes have gone to, onto this building. And Morris and his cohorts saw this kind of architecture as they would a medieval manuscript. Pages might be torn away or ripped 
but it was um, beyond their comprehension that anyone would attempt to put a new page into an old manuscript. Uh, the reading of history in the face of these buildings as a physical uh, lesson was something they gave great import to. And the uh, SPAB, as it's known in England, still goes on today. It's a very important organization. Uh, I happen to be a, a member. And um, it carries out some quite remarkable works. Many of today's great architectural conservators and architects started um, their training as SPAB scholars in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And they are uh, retiring now and new scholars are still in training with this institution. And the Spabcraft Fellows um, emulates the Tour de France of the French Atelier system, uh, giving a chance for Masons to travel the country and train with all the great masters in their particular trades. So the organization carries out a great deal of uh, good, uh, a lot of advocacy, but still holds true to a rather um, conservative uh, attitude towards old buildings. In England, it's known jokingly as the Hezbollah of preservation for its rigorous uh, attention to the manifesto. And it has some rather unfortunate um, results. Uh, SPAB architects on the whole um, like their repairs to be seen as repairs. And you can see in the wall bottom left here that the tiles that are put in the wall there is the repair to the wall. Uh, even though the original stone might be available in the local quarry, even though uh, mason apprentices might be willing to cut stone and place it in the wall, they would rather see their repair to be honest and visible for all to see. I suppose the idea came from Webb and others as they toured the English Midlands and saw at the top of the screen uh, Roman bricks that had been built by the medieval masons into walls to level up courses. Uh, that gave them the idea for this kind of approach to repairs. SPAB also holds by the uh, mantra that old buildings should be old and worn. And I cite the uh, little uh, three-step stair here uh, to a medieval doorway, uh, heavily worn through abrasion over the years. Spab would fight tooth and nail that that be kept in that condition, even though under disabilities, codes around the world, that would be rather difficult for the aged and the infirm to, to cross. Spab wouldn't mind if there was a metal ramp laid over that doorway in order to improve access. But that wouldn't do very much for the aesthetics or the historical uh, ambience of the doorway itself. And these tensions uh, grew throughout the 19th century. At the same time, they were pillaring uh, the ignorant architects about their uh, uh, work. Uh, what has been known, what has become known as the rationalists were taking a stronger hold. And uh, Ted and Norman already mentioned Villers le Duc and his work as the first architect on chef monument historique in France. Um, but in the, U in the UK, George Gilbert Scott in particular carried out a similar sets of exercises. Scott was mortified by the attacks by William Morris and his friends. And actually, uh, from my study of his work and from work by Andrew Saint and others on his work, he did spend an enormous amount of time on archaeological understanding of buildings before he intervened. Uh, of course, the flesh at Notre Dame has uh, become very hot news in the last uh, uh, few months, forgive the pun, uh, as it was burnt away in the Great Fire and is now to be restored to Villela de Duc's design. All the working drawings exist for this flesh. Uh, even though uh, when he was uh, uh, designing it, of course, the, the cathedral had been without a spire for some time since the uh, uh, late 18th century. Uh, the spire he put back is much taller than the one that was there originally. But nevertheless, uh, 
it is based on medieval precedents that he found at Amiens and other places. Uh, Gilbert Scott at Palace of Westminster carried out another radical intervention, which would have a capital R in Ruskin's and Morris's terms. And yet to most discerning critics uh, has actually been quite successful over the years. The center uh, drawing shows how this uh, magnificent space had been neglected and misused as a public records office uh, right up until the uh, uh, middle of the uh, 19th century. Uh, Scott was called in to make a restoration. He removed the shelving, uh, the floorboards to reveal the great uh, 13th, 14th century encaustic tile pavement to reveal the wall paintings from 1320 and uh, to rebuild uh, many of the, the wall uh, openings and to restore a vault and thereby the roof and the flying buttresses. Now, some of this was seen to be conjecture at the time and indeed probably it was to an extent, but he based a lot of this work on the architectural scars he found on the building and on precedents at other cathedrals, notably the chapter house at Lincoln, for example. I worked on this building myself in the uh, 1980s and discovered that uh, Scott had left Christopher Wren's uh, rather primitive roof um, uh, over the adjacent Pix Chapel, uh, accommodating it for posterity. Uh, uh, the wall paintings were as in a good condition uh, when I took over as he found them when he removed all the shelving. Now, if we move to the, uh, the turn of the 20th century, we find that a middle ground was being struck between SPAB, Morris and Ruskin on the one hand, where restoration is a bad thing, and the rationalists who, for whom conjecture was part of being an architect to an, to an extent. And a middle ground was formed principally by two great characters, Sir Charles Piers, uh, an architect and uh, a historian uh, by trade, and Sir Frank Baines, who was the first uh, monument works architect in the Ministry of Works. Between them, they came up with a code of the middle ground where they would seek to present the monuments as they found them, i.e. Uh, without roofs and with leaning walls, but the means to get to that level of presentation sometimes meant some open heart surgery in order to install strengthening materials to make them better. And there's no better example to illustrate this than Tinton Abbey here, uh, a, a, a beautiful uh, uh, location for a Cistercian Abbey in the Wye Valley, uh, enamored by uh, poets, Wordsworth, and by painters, by Turner. You can see a Turner uh, watercolor there, it's top right. Uh, but by the turn of the 20th century, uh, sorely neglected and decayed and covered in damaging ivy, which penetrating all of the design. Uh, this was measured to death, recorded, documented, and then damaged parts were intervened uh, opened up, structural steel was placed in, and the stone, exact stones, put back in the same positions so that no one knew they had been there. Concealment of the repairs was the order of the, order of the day. Now, if we move on to the 21st century, um, we realized that while well, at English Heritage, uh, later to become Historic England, that the way that we approach these buildings uh, was based on um, a sense of value and significance for historic assets and their elements that was based around the function of the connoisseur, that is interpreting some inherent values in the object to the general population. Whereas uh, in effect, all historic works of art uh, are assigned value. They don't have value until it's assigned to them by people. 
And so we radically changed the way that we view monuments, archaeological sites, and historic buildings, putting them into that kind of framework and defining what we thought the values were, which people would assign to these special assets. Uh, obviously, the evidential, the historical, the aesthetic, uh, and communal values, those of the general public who very often can't articulate some of the things they feel about a monument, but nevertheless have important views that should be taken into account. In looking at these sets of values, we determined that uh, Ruskin and Morris had heavily weighed conservation principles in their day towards the evidential and historical values and at the expense of some of the other values. And we sought in the conservation principles to redress that balance. And I give you this worked example uh, nearing conclusion. Uh, it's the Dundas Aqueduct uh, over the River Avon. Um, so there's an aqueduct at the top and a river underneath, a uh, canal on the top and a river underneath. And uh, this was designed by John Rennie in 1801 uh, in a grand classical style, Doric style, made of Bath stone and is a grade one listed structure and a scheduled monument to boot. Uh, uh, the, the waterway companies in the 18th century fell foul of economics when the railways came in uh, and these structures were taken over by the railway companies and out of shot behind the camera in the top picture is actually a railway line running down the side of the aqueduct. The railway engineers couldn't care less about aesthetics and they repaired the masonry with en blue engineering bricks you can see here. This, these aren't stains of mold. These are blue engineering bricks replacing damaged stonework. Uh, it, was, it was proposed to restore this aqueduct and some of our SPAB member architects in our Bristol office said the engineering bricks must stay. The chairman of English Heritage was also the chairman of the canal restoration company and he fired the architects arguing that under the conservation principles we had just espoused, that it was perfectly possible to record and document the engineering interventions of the railway companies, put that in the archives, put it in publications, explain to the public what's gone on, but that the original concept of a classical design by John Rennie was the most important thing, and the aesthetic appearance of the aqueduct was equally important and they should take precedent. An original uh, stone was used from the original quarry to restore the aqueduct. And you can see that there bottom, bottom right. Um, so preservation philosophy has moved uh, in time. Uh, as we've moved on, our uh, arguments have become subtler uh, more gray, less black and white. And I've illustrated that over the slide I'm going to show you next, which is about the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles. At my interview, I showed these two pictures of Tom Hanks and told the audience that I wasn't in the business of Beverly Hills facelifts. The Academy Museum building would look like an old building when I'd finished with it, not a new building. And so it turns out bottom left that that is the case. I conserved almost 90% of the elevations of the old May Company department store there, uh, regretfully having to replace some of the granite because of previous very bad repairs. Renzo Pino's little blob is round the back, of course. Everyone sees the 1939 streamlined design. And a building I'm working on currently with Machado Solvetti who were the architects for the Getty extension is in Monokan, the 1769 ruined plantation house, where I am using SPAB principles to stabilize and repair the historic masonry. And Machado Savetti are going to fill in the, the collapsed missing pieces of the building in structural glass so that we restore the silhouette whilst not falsifying history. To conclude then, uh, despite Ruskin's many lifetime achievements and his outstanding uh, legacy in so many fields of human endeavor, uh, contrary to his own 
polemic and, po and propaganda, he wasn't the first and certainly not the only Victorian to raise concerns. He paid little attention to the history of preservation and restoration before his time from the Renaissance onwards uh, and especially in Europe as well as in the UK. Many of his ideas were based around a view which I would argue is part of the picturesque. As a non-architect, he uh, had to scrape to, uh, towards do nothing or preserve as found as concepts because he didn't know how they could be fixed without damaging their special interests. Several parts of his and William Morris's mantras concerned with honesty have actually uh, been damaging in uh, either physical or aesthetic ways. And now in the latter part of the 20th century with help from Norman's materials and some ingenuity of architects, we have non-destructive diagnostics and monitoring and keyhole surgery techniques so we don't need to have open heart surgery in making our buildings look old. However, Ruskin's love of historic buildings is quite obvious and his warnings not to dis disregard their importance lives on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John and Norman. What a wonderful, rich narrative for us to chew on. Um, especially those of us who um, are um, uh, tasked with uh, conservation of historic structures. And um, uh, I've um, suggested to anyone, if they want to um, ask a question, you can either put it into chat or you can raise your hand right now. Uh, if you've got one, I have one, uh, which I'll kick off with, if that's all right. Uh, and it's, it's for... Um, um, John or, or Norman, um, jump in uh, as you wish. And it's this, at the Gamble House, in planning our conservation project, we firmly elected to retain absolutely as much of the historic fabric as possible uh, and to attempt to delay further deterioration. I was taken to task by some people who felt that major timbers whose ends had rotted should be replaced with new. Who was right? It's a very good question and a very good example, Ted, uh, which I've looked at myself several times. Uh, it, I suppose it depends mostly on your culture and what we haven't talked about uh, really is if did Ruskin have views about the um, Muslim world's uh, response to monuments or or the Japanese or the Chinese. Um, mm. So I'm reminded of the Nara uh, Convention, uh, which is an Ikemos document. Uh, and of course, in, in uh, Japan, preservation uh, in some parts of the country and for certain kinds of shrine is about preservation of the craft. And that then uh, says that uh, every so many years the old building is torn down and completely rebuilt in facsimile using the same tools and techniques. And it's the passing on of the tools and the techniques and the craft, which is more important than the materiality of the object itself. And so uh, I find myself in, 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 in the case of your epoxy ends to your uh, Eve's Joyce, uh, in a bit of a dilemma, I, I, I can see exactly how uh, new ends of wood could have been scarfed on and how the scarfing of timber in California would have been a mightily new extension of craft purposes for many of the guys who claim to be chippies around here. Uh, but that there would be a loss of a material loss of uh, non destroyed non decayed fabric in doing that, because you have to dig into the new wood to make your scarf joint. Using the epoxy stops you having to do that. However, epoxy, tim uh, epoxy external repairs have their own decay processes involved. And I, 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 I'm sort of slowly monitoring your, your building over time to see how that uh, fares in, in, in due course. So uh, that, that's, not, that's not answering your question directly. It's teasing out some of the issues that are around that. Well, in fact, that's what I was hoping you would do. So thank you. 
Thank you for that. Norma, do you have anything if to can, add? Yes, if I can jump in just to add a tiny bit to it. And that is that um, preservation is a, a set of moving targets. And if you look at it from the, or through the lens of philosophy, certainly those philosophies are changing. And John is absolutely correct. Those philosophies are also in a way culture-based, geography-based, um, they represent all sorts of things. But at the same time, the technology of being able to conserve historic fabric and retain it is also changing with time. So you have a whole bunch of things. It's, it's not so much a, a picture as it is a symphony. And if you step out of the room for 30 seconds and you come back, you can't expect it to pick up in the same place. You may not even understand where you are. And so um, the, the kind of question that you posed is a very difficult one. I would give one example of that, which is for decades, many people involved in conservation of museum artifacts have held tightly to this notion that treatments should be reversible, yeah. that we should be able to use materials that a ne the next generation could remove. The problem with that is that applying a philosophy like that to the outside of a building, well, the problem is that weathering is a non-reversible process. That the movement of time itself is a steady forward process, a non-reversible process. So at times we don't have the luxury to say, well, let's do the simplest, easiest thing. Sometimes we have to do, in effect, the most difficult thing we've, we can, or we may need to actually develop some new processes, new materials to be able to achieve what we want. Yeah. And, and, and it's a, you have to have, be pragmatic. So I'm, I'm with the rationalists to an extent. If you scaffold uh, the spire of, of Salisbury Cathedral and you're, you're working at the top of the spire, uh, the expense of getting there is so enormous, you're not going to go back there for another 120 years. So you have to do 120 years worth of work mm. to any decay you find up there, knowing that you can never return to twiddle with something in 10 years time or 20 years time. So uh, kind of standard practice in my world is to uh, be more radical in change uh, where accessibility is, is denied and uh, allow a, a more genteel approach, let's say, uh, where you can walk out and twiddle with a, with a spade. You know. I've got one more thought on that, and, and you just provoked me, John, in that. And I agree completely that the further up in the air you have to go in a building, the less likely you are to ever want to go back there. And certainly <laughs> the less likely you are to be able to get money to go back there. But for us in the, in the uh, world of historic buildings, um, as consultants with experience, we sometimes play the history card. And what we're basically saying to this assembled group of people, all different uh, professions, crafts, and so on. Um, we say, well, historic fabric is really important. It's precious to us. It's the original part of the building. Let's not monkey with it. And then we look around the room and all of a sudden our structural engineer plays the life safety card. <laughs> and suddenly you find that the life safety card trumps the historic fabric card. So it is a giant, uh, a giant kind of poker game, in addition to being what I said before, which is a set of complex moving targets. Yeah. And uh, I'd add one further thing that a lot of this is about perceptions of abnormality. Um, if you've seen lots of leaning walls on medieval uh, structures, you kind of know which ones are going to collapse and which ones, since they've been there for a couple of centuries, are not moving anywhere else. Whereas if you're a new kid around the block, you panic when you see that you reach out for an engineer. So one of the, the tests of a young architect in my office at English Heritage was to send the kids out to a castle along the coast uh, down by the River Thames. And they'd come back and they were panicking because they said there are these huge cracks in the masonry and it's going to fall down and we've got to call the engineers. And, and until I show them the drawings from Sir Frank Baines from 1920, where he had completely stitched the interior with reinforced concrete to, to stop it moving apart, but left the crack as evidence of what had happened. Hmm. 
uh, and and uh, you you could have a real eye opener with those kind of discussions. Yeah, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I've got a, a question here um, for Norman um, about um, the poster of Darwin. Uh, your last slide. Who yes. who created that poster image? Well. It looks to me like a serious copyright infringement. It looks like, I mean, obviously it's based on the Shepherd Fairy um, Obama uh, posters. And I honestly don't know. I found it someplace. I suspect um, that it may be in the courts as we speak, but it's a, great, <laughs> it's a great example of something that was easy for me to end on. And it really represented for me as well, this intermingling of people, of families, of ideas um, it, it is very reminiscent of something that I don't know how many of you here this evening are fans of uh, English murder mysteries. I suspect there could be quite a few of you. Um, uh, certainly we are in my household. And uh, the funny thing is, of course, that if you watch enough of them, and the ones that particularly have the typical village settings, you're watching uh, uh, Agatha Christie and occasionally uh, and Poirot, and you're watching Midsummer Murders and, and all those others, after a while, we, my wife and I say to each other, are there only 12 actors in England? Because we <laughs> saw that fellow just last night in something else. And yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's, partially, it's partially that story that you need, as I was making a plea, that you need to understand who the people were and what they wrote and what they said and so on. And John was saying the same thing, particularly understanding that Ruskin huge in tension. Um, you also need to have a sense of the scale of these places. Um, were these big cities? They are now, but were they then? What was the total population? Uh, how, how complex uh, a set of institutions was at work at that time? For example, in, in about 1770, just prior to the American Revolution, I understand that the second largest English speaking city in the world was Philadelphia more so than other cities like Manchester and Birmingham that became much bigger later on in the 19th century. Um, and so we, we have, don't have that perspective. Or in Europe, more broadly, the largest city in Europe between 1550 and 1700 was Naples, the largest. that had the biggest population, the most complex political structures and so on. So that's part of the issue here, putting yourself back in time to try to understand what was going on then, and then look at it and say, well, I guess if I had lived in the Midlands, I would have tried hard to meet one of the Wedgwoods and maybe join a club and meet a few more people and suddenly become part of that science and technology scene. Mm -hmm. It was not as difficult as it is today with the literally hundreds of technology universities that one could have to first participate with. So um, that's part of understanding history is to be able to roll yourself back into it. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for that perspective. We're getting a lot of um, accolades, thanks, and um, uh, from uh, from uh, uh, from lots of people. Uh, and here's a question from from uh, Don Hahn. Hello, Don. In restoring the May Company building for the Academy Museum, is the restoration done with an awareness of the Renzo Piano edition, or is it done in isolation? Uh, was there an awareness or a conversation about the LACMA campus as a whole? Zumtor's new design, for example, or again, just done in isolation. That's a, that's a, oh, a, a, a neat question pitching. and quite topical. Um, uh, Renzo was hired before everybody else. And uh, he was told that he had to keep the May Company building. Everything, everything else after that was uh, his invention, in a sense. And he based his design on uh, what I think is an artificial axis, but it's there, which is the pathway uh, between uh, his LACMA buildings, uh, which runs uh, east to west. And, and uh, therefore the uh, golf ball theatre uh, concept is separated from the department store by, by bridges. Um, so his designs were conceptual. Uh, he, he and his teams worked out how the department store was to be used. And then the executive architects are Gensler, working with Borough Happelt. And they're responsible for the whole project and for its uh, uh, detailed design and construction. When it came to the May Company's facades, all the previous firms of consultants had said, 
it's a disaster, the steelwork's corroding, the stonework's cracking and falling off. Take it all off and we'll put new stuff back and it'll look just the same. And then the folks down at City Hall will be happy because it'll look just the same. And the museum said, hang on, we're a museum. The May Company building is the biggest object in our collection and museums are about conserving stuff. So that's when I got a knock on the door and a uh, complete change of plan. And I discovered quite quickly that in fact, there wasn't enough stone in the original Texas quarry to have replaced every, every piece. Not that I was going that route at all. Uh, and what I did was to stabilize the existing material on the building, uh, deal with all the corroding metalwork and, uh, and, and go from there. So, and, and I was a special case. I was hired by the museum directly, not by the architects because they were concerned about the responsibility for that approach. But, you know, it's quite a young building in my collection of work. And uh, again, it's down to perceptions of abnormality, really. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and uh, it, it uh, puts me in mind of, of um, uh, the increased focus on sustainability and on the notion that um, uh, oftentimes the most sustainable building is the one that's already there and uh, with it, with all of its original clothing. Um, so uh, uh, well, well done. Uh, here's a, a really interesting question that came in. Um, uh, who decides when old begins or how has the concept old changed in the course of our speakers' careers? Uh, Norman, uh, you're, um, you're old. Uh, do you want to take that? <laughs> Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and please don't show that photo that you yeah, showed me earlier. Got it right here. I'm going to no, share no, screen no. any moment now. <laughs> no, I'm too young in that picture. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. It's a great question because, um, well, let me personalize it then. I, I did start teaching in the 1970s at uh, 1977. I think it was the same year in which I met uh, John Fiddler. Am I right, John? I think it was 77. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been friends ever since then. Um, he... Uh, having just finished architecture school, came to the States to visit. And uh, I asked him what he really wanted to do with his life. And he said he wanted to be, someday he'd be head of conservation for English heritage. And I said, oh yes, sure, <laughs> wonderful. And of course, then it, it happened. Um, but, but to come back to, to my thinking of the 70s, 80s, as we got into the early 80s, maybe 83, 84, um, I began to recognize that the 20th century was winding down and that we were still teaching an awful lot of things about materials without recognizing the materials of the 20th century. And there was by the mid 1980s, a sense that we had to figure out how to educationally place value on things like reinforced concrete um, at a time when many of the laws did not yet permit us to designate buildings as landmarks. We had to get some special a designation if something wasn't 50 years old. And so I began teaching conservation of concrete. I remember offering the class for the first time at Columbia, and I think three students showed up. And basically they came to attend the first class and said, what do you mean by historic concrete? Isn't that an oxymoron? And I said, well, maybe it seems that way right now, but by the time you finish and have a career by the year 2000, and they said, oh my God, the year 2000, is that coming? And I said, yes, and by that time, we're gonna be worried about things like this. So. Um, I'm back to that point that I made earlier that everything I think in my life is a moving target of some sort. And I offered uh, with a colleague of mine, the Ted knows, uh, Stephen Gottlieb, we decided to do some lectures out in the Midwest again on conservation of concrete. Again, three students showed up from the whole country, but one of them pulled some photos out and he said, what do you think of this? And we said, that looks like falling water. He says, yes, I'm in charge of a all the maintenance work there, would you be willing to come and look at the building we're having trouble? That was in 1987 or 88. And so my whole, my path has changed directions quite a number of times. Now I'm just as interested in, because I do a lot of product uh, r and I'm just as interested in testing and developing new products for conserving cement stuccos as I am for dealing with uh, brick and mortar. And remember that it wasn't really until the 19, well, what, 70s again, I guess, that there was serious interest in terracotta buildings because they were still thought of as being much too young. Um, 
Mm-hmm. So that's the great part about getting old is that you get to see all this new stuff. And the wonderful thing right now is that all of my students who are in their what, early to mid 20s didn't know a world when the Guggenheim Museum wasn't there for them. They didn't know a time when all of these buildings weren't important. To them, mid-century modern is wonderful. It's cool. It's hip. I don't have to convince them to get excited about learning about the materials, studying the decay processes, understanding how to do repairs and how to uh, use materials, chemical and physical materials to sustain the lives of these things. So it gives also a new definition to the the whole concept of sustainability. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Here's one for John. Uh, What are some cross-cultural differences that you face in which restoration is abandoned to allow both time and the elements to take their course. Those are sort of the, uh, the Ruskinian extreme. Um, and uh, I, I, um, I can think of uh, Rhinus Wenzel in the, in the uh, Southwest, uh, but uh, maybe you've got another idea. Well, um, essentially uh, Ruskin was working with, with the vectors of, of time and nature in relation to, to uh, the ruination of, of, uh, of things he didn't want to see fixed. And unfortunately, that's, that's coming towards us at a great pace now with global warming. And a policy developed during my time at uh, English Heritage, although not uh, particularly by, by me, although the consequences uh, were, were dealt with by me, was the question in the United Kingdom of managed retreat. Uh, And it goes like this, um, taking Norman's history of geology, the British Isles is tilting at the edge of the continental plate and the southeast corner is dipping into the waves. At the same time as the polar ice caps are melting and sea level is rising and the Gulf Stream will shift and weather conditions are going to get worse. And this is all predicted to happen in the next 20, 30 years. That means that uh, low-lying estuarine heritage in terms of Saxon churches, uh, Norman churches, uh, various coastal defenses, of great antiquity are going to be lost to the waves and there's no no alternative solution. There isn't the money on the planet to be able to defend the coastline of England from geology and the weather unless we do something drastic about climate change. But even then, the geology is gonna deal, deal for the South Coast dramatically. Uh, the center of London is going to have 20 feet floods by the turn of the next century. So there's some dramatic things afoot. And so the concept of managed retreat, whereas we identify historic assets, which inevitably have to go to the waves uh, and they are recorded in as many ways as we can, physically, emotionally, and so on, and then let go is something that's only now starting to happen on on a great scale. I have to say, though, this has happened in the past and on the coast of Essex, for example, there are whole medieval towns which are only just still under the waves. And uh, you can see a couple of the rooftops on uh, on low tide days. So it's happened before and it will happen again. But uh, the coastline of England is changing dramatically and and we will abandon these wonderful structures to the waves. Ed. Are you there? I would uh, just like to make an observation, if if possible. Yes, absolutely. Uh, James Spates is speaking from... Oh, uh, okay. So uh, I want to underscore one of the things both of our speakers, wonderful as they have been tonight, certainly know this. I want to underscore one of the fundamental principles of Ruskin's argument against conservation. It's fundamentally a sociological argument. He, argue, he argues, in, in effect, and most brilliantly, I think, in The Seven Lamps, that um, this, the, the, these great creations of the Middle Ages are a function of culture. They come out of a certain time and a certain way of looking at the world and a certain 
religious belief system and and that that whole phenomenon and that those things are imbued in the stone are imbued in the, are imbued in the carvings in the individual figurines that are now being lost to time and so he said why would you pres preserve those in fact he would say you you simply can't preserve those because those people are dead and they've been now dead a very long time and they took with them they took with them their culture they took with them their understanding they took with them their history their their feeling for what they did with their chisels and their hammers and the result of that is that nobody else today has any of those same feeling tones that they had in those days and so we simply cannot recreate and preserve the things that they did six or seven hundred years ago hence they should go and the new time our new things the things that we know the things that we believe things that we do with our hands should go into whatever buildings we create it's a fundamentally sociological argument, a cultural argument, a historical argument. The past goes. Um, our, our speakers tonight have, have both said this in their various ways. Uh, the past goes, and so you must let it go. Um, as, as, as was just said, the waves are coming, and, and so new waves have to come, and new people have to build up a new culture. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, Ted, if I can add something to that, yeah. it, it reflects a little bit both on what uh, Jim said and what uh, John was saying about recording. That's also, of course, such a feature of Ruskin's own passion, particularly in Venice, seeing the destruction uh, as he saw it by restoration in many cases, but certainly by, by urban renewal going on in Venice in the 19th century. Uh, Ruskin would be, his whole uh, almost obsession was to record these buildings and the details of these buildings uh, before they were they were gone forever. That it was crucial that this be part of our collective memory, but without but without uh, acknowledging the loss that this that this will inevitably. Uh, bring so that's I think that's also a part of Ruskin's uh, uh, passion to to record and to preserve from memory, especially uh, you know uh, details that are that are remarkable or an original in in these buildings. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good points, both of those. And, and in fact, some of Ruskin's renderings are mm. they're they're imbued with a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, that they provide the viewer with uh, a remarkable sense of the absolute condition of that. Whereas a lot of today's laser scanning is 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 cold, if you understand. It's uh, it's so objective. Um, it it loses a lot of meanings which are there otherwise yeah, yeah. by an artist, and and that's to be regretted. I, I feel. Um, Norman and I, I don't know, I'll, I can't speak for Norman, but my sense is that my conservation, uh, as a conservation architect, my job is to slow down time, uh, not to stop it. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I, I work in a subjective field, all conservation interventions are subjective, and uh, they're brought about by the culture you come from, and your understanding of what's in front of you as phenomena and how to deal with it. But essentially I'm trying to slow down time, to slow down the inevitable loss, rather than um, egotistically claim that I'm going to freeze time forever. I don't think that's, that's possible. Uh, and more importantly, um, I've got to recognize the own limitations of my own uh, century and my own talents and skills. I also have to leave some fun for the next generation <laughs> to attempt the same. Uh, and so um, I, I try wherever I can to document not just what I did, but why I did it. Right. I agree with I agree with that, John, about uh, being unable to bring decay process rates down to zero. Zero is not an available number for us. But the problem there is that the discussion of decay, 
and decay as a function of time, which is obviously weathering typically, um, often is in the context of people assuming they have to do one thing and then walk away. Yeah. And so very often people have been sold on an idea or literally sold a, a substance and they're told, well, this is it. This is going to work forever. You don't have to worry about that building again. I mean, even the homeowner, the casual uh, building owner who is told this new roof, you will never need another roof again if you put this roof on and you'll never have to do anything to it. It's maintenance free. Um, that's just such nonsense because I think all of us who've worked in this field for decades have understood that uh, maintenance is a, is a key to being able to deal with the issues here, to being able to say, well, we'll fix it this way, but that's gonna last probably 15 to 20 years. Let's schedule some other work. And in fact, let's go back in two years from now and do an inspection, make sure the thing is doing well. And let's plan every five years to look at the roof again, because we might have to replace that in 20 more years. It's all about scheduling the clock. It's all about when do we rewind the clock? Not so much saying that we could actually freeze all these moments by doing some um, absurd and clearly super expensive intervention. The only, the only way we can do that, and it's done rarely, is if we bring pieces of buildings or sometimes an entire building, like the Temple of Dandur at the Metropolitan Museum, if we bring it inside, then we're sealing it off from weathering processes and, and so on. But most architecture lives outside. That's where it was built. That's where it's designed to be. And so buildings that were built to be out in the weather are going to have to simply have that level of maintenance and then choices made of relatively high performance materials as substitutes, as repairs. We're looking for the best quality stone of that generic type to match the original and so on. That's, that's the management aspect of conservation, which is really the most, to me, the most significant. Yeah, and, and that's something that both Ruskin and Morris uh, paid a lot of attention to, you know, set up the watchtowers, the monitor. Um, right, right, the yeah. great quote. Yeah. Those are uh, yeah. universal truths in a sense, and we couldn't forget that. Uh, the other thing that goes with this is that uh, not all historic buildings were actually very well built. <laughs> There's a lot of junk that we revere, I'm afraid. Uh, take Monokan, which I'm working on down in, in Virginia. Um, uh, the son-in-law, Lightfoot Lee, the other Virginian signatory to the declaration, uh, he, as son-in-law, he got the tail end piece of land from his father-in-law and the junk stone from the bottom of the garden. Uh, he sent his house right to uh, London to crib some pages from the pattern books and came back with a design with a bit of Batty Langley, a bit of James Gibbs. So he got a Neopalladian front and sides and then used this terrible ironstone, which you couldn't cut a straight arras on if, you, if they paid them, uh, and indentured servants and the poor old slaves had to put together a stone building in essentially a brick tradition area of America. Mm. And as a consequence, there's nothing holding the bits together and that's why it fell down. Uh, and on the design point, um, um, Greg, um, you, you, you said you had a question on Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he had some challenging, uh, courageous designs that uh, don't always uh, do so well at, out in the weather. Yes, his, his um, concrete houses here in Southern California are infamous for their disastrous uh, self-destruction and and costs and um i'd love i haven't heard any updates but I, I did have the pleasure of doing some restoration on the wood in a couple of those houses in the the teak flooring in the ennis brown house and the um, oak strip flooring in the house that joel silver owned mm -hmm. and um one other point i wanted to make just about the wood from the earlier conversation is you know to, to me a lot of it as a practical sort of construction manager and, and person interested in historic restoration is, is the wood available, right? Uh, I know that uh, the house that Ted is responsible for, they have a beautiful quarter sun, I think white oak uh, herringbone floors, uh, 
and uh, in the kitchen, it's maple strip. Now, right. now those, you know, woods can still be found in quantities large enough if you select out of a big enough pool to do restoration. But the more difficult tropical woods that are more rare might be more problematic. So, uh, Ted, I'd love to come out and look at, uh, at the house again. Great. Uh, Thank you. I just got, I just wrote down your phone number. <laughs> but, uh, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear, um, any updates. I, I remember I, I had a heartbreaking, uh, tour of the Friedman house with my father, who was an architect and was very, uh, uh, sympathetic to restoration and, and history. And after we looked at it, it was in such a state, I said to him, you know, what could be done? And, and he said, nothing. Uh, I, so I'm curious to hear from you gentlemen who are more knowledgeable and uh, about the current situation. Well, I was involved with studies at the Freeman House and then um, as well, the textile blocks down at Florida Southern which is the biggest grouping of right buildings anywhere on that campus in, in Lakeland, Florida. And then, um, uh, John, weren't you involved with uh, Ennis? Yeah, Ennis? both Freeman and Ennis, yeah. Right, so we, we all sort of come at it in different directions, and then we were together on that Florida mission for World Monuments Fund. Um, the textile block houses, in terms of the block itself, all I'll say is that it was a very ridiculous system of construction, and it was really right passing it along to another family member who passed the production of the blocks on to people who really didn't know anything at all. At Freeman, you may, you may have heard this story that the person who actually produced the blocks from the molds was a high school kid doing, during, doing it during the summer, had no prior experience. But there is a pattern like this with an awful lot of even more serious Frank Lloyd Wright buildings like, like Falling Water where um, he went through two different contractors. Um, Wright's habit with most of the smaller residential buildings was to actually, it seemed to me, select a contractor who wouldn't talk back, who would not challenge the drawings and the ideas and say, I'm sorry, Frank, but this is not gonna work. And when he finally found contractors who wouldn't say that, many of the houses got built with construction systems and materials that were really quite dreadful. At Freeman, my original idea was that perhaps the specification, which was very brief and specified the block as one part cement, four parts sand. That was the entire specification for the blocks. I originally thought, well, maybe there was a chance that he pulled that one to four mix design from some publications a little bit earlier that often used a shorthand. When they said four, they meant two sand plus two, two gravel to specify a concrete rather than a, a essentially a mortar block. But uh, Jeff Chase had later convinced me, no, that it was more likely that they had a limited number of molds, which were expensive, and an awful lot of uh, sizes and right hand and left hand and fills and lentils and so on. Any, any building that looks simple because it comes out of molds, you often have a tremendous multiplicity of molds. And they were too expensive to produce lots of them. The idea was to make a mix that was really dry enough that you could easily unmold. And that's what the one to four mix did. Unfortunately, since the fellow who was doing the work was doing it in the summer, he would unmold each one and just leave it outside. So the water left by evaporation very quickly. And ultimately a lot of the cement didn't really hydrate properly. It was a, it was a poor material used in a really bad construction system that didn't protect the building in any way. And we saw the same thing in Florida where there yeah. were some buildings that were actually built by students on the campus with the same problem, limited number of molds, no expertise, no proper oversight, and material specifications that were just plain silly. Yeah, yeah. One thing is, is for certain though, Norman and I will never be out of work. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, yes. until you want to be, I hope. Um, it is after seven and um, uh, uh, Victoria Martino uh, had her hand up a while ago and uh, Alice very patiently has been waiting with her hand up. And, uh, and my boss, Gabriel, has told me that there's a question about Ada, Ada Louise Huxtable. Um, uh, does anybody want to um, uh, insist? Um, uh, 
I would I would vote for our two speakers coming back for a whole session of, of uh, very good. Excellent. <laughs> well, yeah, excellent, excellent point. Um, so Victoria or Alice, do you want to uh, pose your question or uh, uh, are you uh, willing to um, uh, to uh, pass it off to Gabe? Well, I think the way you phrased that, it's it's a kind of rhetorical question. <laughs> That's why I suggested another session. Um, I, I would love to engage in a session with our speakers. Uh, well, with all everybody here that's so um, you know well informed, um, dealing with these topics that were covered tonight um, more from a from a sort of philosophical point of view, mm -hmm. sort, of, mm -hmm. sort of taking on as it were what would what would the Ruskin of our time say about the situation in light of the you know new materials and technologies etc so um, yeah if I were to launch into any of my many questions it would be a whole new session so I would love if they could be invited back to um, to engage with the community it would be wonderful thank you well, Victoria, you, idea, Victoria think, you've guys. given me my line <laughs> 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 I was going to say that uh, we can all see why uh, we uh, hope to be able to tackle this topic over several weeks. Uh, and I think uh, we would love to be able to engage this again. The whole topic of preservation, historical preservation, uh, restoration is such an important topic. And again, from so many different angles. I really do, before we close out, I do wanna give uh, Ruskin uh, the last word here, um, a comment that reflects very much what both Norman and John were saying about time. And again, Ruskin is always thinking, is speaking about these things as not as a builder uh, or a maker, but as a, as a thinker. Uh, and uh, this is of course about slowing time, but not being able to stop it. Take proper care of your monuments Watch an old building with an anxious care. Guard it as best you can and at any cost from every influence of dilapidation. Count its stones as you would the jewels of a crown. Set watches about it as if at the gates of a besieged city. Bind it together with iron where it loosens. Stay it with timber where it declines and do this tenderly and reverently and continually and many a generation will still be born and pass away beneath its shadow. Its evil day must come at last. But let it come declaredly and openly and let no dishonoring and false substitute deprive it of the funeral offices of memory. So we wanna especially thank uh, Norman and John for their for not only for their expertise, but for really broadening and contexting this discussion and bringing it really into so many of the issues that we're dealing with uh, in our own time. Um, I also uh, want to thank Ted for leading us uh, through this, this, uh, this complex topic and discussion. Um, and uh, Katrina always, our, who's uh, our intern, who's helping us with all the technical aspects, which I don't begin to understand. Um, let me talk just a little bit uh, about next week and the, uh, the next uh, event, by the way, is next Thursday, not two weeks, but next Thursday. Um, Crafting America. It's a new exhibition developed by Crystal Bridges uh, in Bentonville, Arkansas which celebrates the skill and individuality of craft within the broad context of American art. From jewelry to furniture to sculptures and more, uh, this exhibition is dazzling and full of surprises, featuring over 100 works in ceramics, fiber, wood, metal, glass, and more unexpected materials, they say. Crafting America presents a diverse and inclusive story of the American craft from the 1940s to today. We will be led through this exhibition, this new exhibition, by its curators, the two curators who developed it. Uh, Jen Pageant and Glenn Adamson will take us on a virtual tour uh, 
of this marvelous and landmark uh, exhibition. Uh, Suzanne Iskin again will be with us uh, to help moderate, um, moderate the presentation and the discussion afterwards. So next, next Thursday, the 18th of March, 5 p.m., uh, be with us and uh, uh, share this news with your friends because we, we would love to have a great audience for that presentation. Uh, visit us on our website, www.ruskinartclub.org. Lots of changes there, lots of new information on events, on membership, all kinds of things. So um, we'll look forward to seeing you all next Thursday. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks, Norman, John, Ted. Thank you. <laughs> John, thank you so much. Norman, great. Thanks, everybody. Dad, you still with us? Yeah, all good. Yes. Great. Thanks thank so much. Thank you very much. Very good one. Maya, good to see you. She goes off. Next. Thanks, Gabriel. Thank you Thanks, so much. John and Norman, thank you. wonderful program. Maya, get rid of the bitch. It would be good, Norman, to think about some uh, yep. way we could re-engage this discussion, maybe with a new aspect. Yep. We, can, we can certainly talk further. Great. Let's, Terrific. let's talk about it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Signing off now. Thanks, Gabriel. See you later. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Ted. Norman, great to see you.